It was a cold winter night in Westminster. A new session of Parliament was due to open the following morning. Just after midnight, a search party entered the cellars below the old Parliament House. The date was November the 5th, 1605. Under the vaults, they found a stranger, booted and spurred. And hidden under firewood, 36 barrels of gunpowder, enough to blow up Parliament 20 times over. The man they arrested was a Catholic soldier called Guy Fawkes. The first link in the chain of the greatest terrorist conspiracy Britain has ever known. If they had succeeded in doing what they wanted to do, it would have been the bloodiest and most appalling plot in English history. It was the first attempt to blow up the entire British establishment. Let's take a checklist of who would have been present had that explosion gone off. The king, the queen, the princes, the lords, the bishops, the gentry, the judges. It's the first real attempt to use gunpowder technology for widespread terrorism. In other words, it's the gunpowder equivalent of the atomic bomb strike on Hiroshima. On Sunday the 20th of May, 1604, in the Duck and Drake Inn just off the Strand in London, five men met in an upper room. They were there to plan the assassination of King James I and the destruction of his entire government. This gunpowder plot was not the brainchild of the infamous Guy Fawkes. They'd met at the summons of a young man called Robert, or Robin, Catesby. Catesby's clearly the leader. He's the man with charisma, the man who recruits other people. He's the man who has the idea of blowing up the Palace of Westminster. So we ought really to call it Catesby's night rather than Guy Fawkes' night. Catesby's far and away, I think, the most attractive personality among the gunpowder plotters. Everybody agrees he was an absolutely charismatic figure. He was the sort of person who, if you met whatever resistance you'd initially planned to his ideas, they crumbled. What had led Robert Catesby to such a drastic plan of action? On the surface, he seemed hardly the type. In 1602, in Queen Elizabeth's England, he appeared to have everything going for him. Catesby was a young nobleman with a dashing reputation as a swordsman and man of action. He had land, he had connections. But in a country as aggressively Protestant as Queen Elizabeth's, one thing counted against Robert Catesby. He was Catholic and proud of it. He's not, as it were, a crypto-Catholic. He's an out-and-out -out Catholic with a very strong view of the burdens that Catholics bear and that Catholics should not be passive but should seize an opportunity to better their condition. In the 70 years since the English Reformation, most Catholics had learned to keep their heads down and their faith to themselves. Most even attended church with their Protestant neighbors. But not Catesby. He was part of a network of wealthy Catholic families who refused to conform, who chose instead to suffer crippling fines for non-attendance. The government called them Recusants. A recusant is somebody, comes from the Latin word recusare, to refuse. And a recusant is somebody who refuses to give outward conformity. Uh, somebody who will not say, well, I'm Catholic inside, 
but I'm not a Catholic outside, uh, very much like uh, the people in Eastern Europe uh, who refuse to, to conform, what we, what we call the refuseniks. You nearly always get in any society, uh, particularly societies that are under pressure, some people who will not agree to go along with the mass. Uh, and the recusants are those sorts of people. In her Warwickshire manor house, Catesby's cousin Anne Vaux lived in a private Catholic world. Priests were sheltered in secret, children sent to be educated in Catholic schools abroad. In their own eyes, the recusants were a beleaguered minority struggling to keep the true faith alive. But to the authorities, people like Anne Vaux and her cousin Catesby seemed dangerous. England was at war with Catholic Spain. It made the recusants potential fifth columnists, an enemy within, a security risk to be watched at all costs. The most commonly used comparison of the life of a Catholic and Elizabethan England in the modern day is that of being a communist in 1950s America. But to be a communist in 50s America is a holiday camp compared with being a Catholic recusant under Elizabeth. For a start, you're always in danger of having your property searched, usually at night and always without warning. You are always politically suspect. You're regarded as being the agent of a foreign power, subverting everything for which the realm stood. Above all, if you actually do what a Catholic's supposed to do, which is uh, hear the word of God according to your church, you need a priest. If you harbour a priest, you're in serious trouble. At Badsley Clinton in the summer of 1602, Anne Vaux was secretly harbouring the leading Jesuit priest in England, Father Henry Garnet. You have to remember that from 1585 to 1604, England is at war, and that therefore, things like sheltering priests who come from Spain or from the Spanish Netherlands is a quite different thing from a purely religious gesture. It's, it's a potentially very hostile and very threatening gesture to the English war effort and to the English government. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Garnet lived a covert existence, moving from house to house, celebrating the mass in secret. As a Jesuit, he was part of a new order of priests sent to England to stir up Catholic revival, to undermine Elizabeth's authority as head of the English church. The government feared Jesuit priests because in 1570, the Pope published a bull excommunicating Elizabeth I. That bull released all their subjects from their allegiance to her and encouraged them to depose her. Indulgentio, absolutione. Such fighting talk inspired Catesby and his cousin. The hope of a Catholic revival was what gave them the strength to live as recusants. They knew that to harbour a man as dangerous to the Protestant state as Henry Garnet risked imprisonment, even death. But that was the price of their faith. But the question was, when would the Catholic revival begin? Despite the best efforts of the Jesuits, most English Catholics were drifting into conformity. The Protestant church had never seemed more secure. For Catesby, to turn round Catholic fortunes, it was clear some radical change was needed. Dominus fubiscum. Et cum spiritu tuo. Ite misa est. Deo gratis. In the autumn of 1602, a friend of Catesby's called Thomas Percy rode north to Edinburgh to meet James VI of Scotland on a mission on behalf of English Catholics. What they hoped was that Catholicism would be tolerated. And, of course, there was no chance of that while Elizabeth was alive. But although she'd had a long and glorious reign, uh, even Elizabeth was subject to mortality, and it was clear she was going to die. And it was clear that the next occupant of the throne would almost certainly be James, James of Scotland. 
And James himself had allowed it to be known that when he came to the throne, Catholics would be allowed to live a free life. James was a Protestant, but appeared tolerant of Catholics. He was the son of the Catholic martyr, Mary Queen of Scots, and his own wife had converted to the old faith. As the future king, he seemed an answer to recusant prayers. He was a rather crude and vulgar man who was physically in many ways repulsive because he wasn't very clean, he slobbered. And he was, he was a sort of a, a, not exactly misshapen, but a, a little man who was very ungainly. And he had a predilection for male favorites, although he did conduct a very happy married life with his queen who bore him about nine children in all. James is really a very intelligent man with a bad PR kind of image. Uh, he, he's Donnish. He'd have been a really good professor of theology or law at Edinburgh University the present day. He's really bright. He writes well. He speaks well. He's got a good brain. James is uncomfortably aware that in a Europe divided between Protestant and Catholic, if he pleases both, he's safe. He wins both sides. And so what he does is, he gives the Protestant English every possible public reassurance. At the same time, he's tipping the wink privately to English Catholics. Thomas Percy was a poor relation of the powerful Earl of Northumberland. As a convert, he was a zealous champion of the Catholic cause. One of the most unfortunate aspects of James's diplomacy before coming to the English throne is the way in which he'll receive private visitors and will let them believe what they wish. How is my lord Northumberland? And the classic man here is Thomas Percy, who's going to be one of the gunpowder conspirators. He's connected to the Earl of Northumberland, one of the great magnates of uh, the English realm. And he trots up to Scotland to check out James and try and get a solid promise from him to give toleration to English Catholics. And the general mood in London? James doesn't give any solemn promises so, at all. Believe... What he seems to do is encourage Percy to believe what Percy wishes to believe. I find the English a factious people, Mr. Percy. So, if I may, we are merely seeking concord. Oh, I shall rule England as I rule Scotland, Mr. Percy, with nothing but concord in mind. What to James was a political ploy seems to have been taken by Percy as a genuine statement of belief and also a, a genuine commitment to do something. And it's fairly clear that James never intended it to be any such thing. Send my greetings to Lord Northumberland. Your Majesty. And so Percy returned to England, carrying the dangerous idea that James had promised toleration for English recusants. English Catholics, when they heard about this, uh, assumed that it was virtually all over, rather like uh, people in occupied Europe felt in 1944. Liberation had come, uh, the dictators had gone, you could throw your hats in the air uh, and live a perfectly normal life. Six months later, on March the 24th, 1603, Queen Elizabeth died and James VI of Scotland became James I of England. When James comes down from Scotland, it's the classic honeymoon period. He's doing everything that a king initially should. He's hunting everything that runs and knighting everything that crawls. He lathers the British nation with flattery, with honors. And as part of this, he relaxes the persecution of Catholics. He remits the recusancy fines, that is to say, he, he instructs the collectors of recusancy fines simply not to collect them. So there is a period of easement for about a year. But by the summer of 1604, it's clear that nothing is going to happen by way of a formal toleration. The recusancy laws have not been repealed, nothing has been done to grant greater liberties to Catholics, Clearly, James intended to do nothing for them. English Catholics felt betrayed, and none more so than Thomas Percy. As he saw it, James had proved weak, buckling under the weight of English Protestant opinion. By 1604, the honeymoon for English Catholics was over. 
Under pressure from Parliament, James reimposed the recusancy fines, and an edict was passed ordering all Catholic priests out of the country. Those that stayed risked being hunted down as in the worst days of Elizabeth. Henry Garnet had written of James's accession as a golden time of unexpected freedom. The reality was hard to bear. For Robert Catesby, a lifetime of resentment drew into sharp focus, and the object of his hatred was the man who'd betrayed them. He's somebody who dared to promise them all that they rightfully deserve, who even may have held out a promise of someday coming back to the true religion himself. What happens? He tries this transparent trick of relaxing the fines just to see how the Protestants react, and as soon as a few of them start bleating, what does he do? He starts persecuting the Catholics all over again, bringing back the old terrible Elizabethan regime just to curry favour with a heretical church. So, from that moment onwards, to a genuine Catholic extremist, James deserves to die. It's as simple as that. I think the really dangerous moment in any political situation is not when people have been so oppressed for so long that they've been ground into the earth. It's when their hopes have risen and suddenly you try and put the genie back in the bottle and you can't do it. It creates an explosive situation. And that's what happened in 1604. And so it was in the spring of 1604 that Robert Catesby made his decision to blast King James and his Protestant regime to pieces. Sunday the 20th of May, 1604. In the Duck and Drake just off the Strand in one of old London's most fashionable quarters, Robert Catesby met with four friends. But it wasn't a social gathering. This was the meeting that was to set in motion the gunpowder plot. I swear to disclose nothing that I hear today, so help me God. I swear to disclose nothing of what I hear today, so help me God. I swear to disclose nothing of what I hear today, so help me God. The gunpowder conspirators themselves were wild and rather silly young men. What I hear today, so help me God. They weren't normal English Catholics. They were relatively young, their average age was in the 30s. And on the whole, they're adventurers. Uh, they are people whose personalities are fairly unstable, whose finances are in even worse condition than their personalities, and who feel on the whole that they're ready to take the biggest risk of all, which is losing their limbs, their heads, their fortunes, for the sake of the jackpot, which is winning England back for Catholicism. The meeting began with a vow of secrecy, and then Catesby outlined his blood-curdling plan. I aim to strike a blow with powder. The target was the state opening of Parliament. The weapon, gunpowder. The gunpowder plot is remarkable because of the scale of the attempt on the life and apparatus of the Stuart Crown. There have been previous assassination attempts, which were matters of bullets or daggers or perhaps poison, directed, directed at a particular individual, a monarch. But this targeted the entire ruling class, the entire establishment of Stuart Protestant England. If you take a register of who would have been destroyed had the explosion succeeded, not just the king, the queen, the princes, the royal family, the heirs to the throne, the continuity of the dynasty, also all of the lords, all of the bishops, all of the members of parliament, the leading gentry and judges, the entire representative of the Stuart state, all would have been destroyed in one blow. And, and that is, I think, remarkable and unprecedented. For this devastating act, Catesby had recruited four men he knew he could trust. The first, Thomas Percy, still smarting from his misreading of James's intentions. Second, Catesby's cousin, Tom Winter, stocky and round-faced, fired up with a recent and passionate reconversion to the faith of his childhood. Third, Jack Wright, Catesby's oldest friend. And finally, 
a more mysterious character, recruited for his expertise in mining and explosives. He called himself Guido Fawkes. Now, Guy Fawkes was a Catholic from Yorkshire. His relatives on his mother's side were the chief influence in his life. They were Catholics. And he became very much the equivalent of a sort of hardline Catholic terrorist. Guy Fawkes had been an experienced mercenary soldier in the southern Netherlands, the area that we would now call Belgium. And he had been fighting for the Catholic forces there. It was a well-known area where English Catholic men might go for military experience, might go to get away from their families, away from the recusancy laws. He comes over as an extremely dour, brave, relatively unimaginative Yorkshireman with very considerable technical skills. Fawkes had been fighting in the Netherlands for over 10 years. He'd been back in England for less than a month. It was Winter who introduced him to Catesby. Fawkes was vital because at this early stage, Catesby had no practical idea of how to take out Parliament. Fawkes knew about siege warfare. He knew about digging mines. He knew how to lay gunpowder for maximum impact. All Catesby knew was that the effect must be total. It must result in the complete destruction of the ruling elite. Create that political vacuum, whatever the cost, and God would do the rest. Are you with me? Aye. 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 I will venture my life, Robin. Good man. Good man. Good man. Catesby was a fanatic. And like most fanatics, he had an absolute conviction of the rightness of his own actions. God was with him, he was doing God's work. And if it involved blowing up lots of people, many of whom were innocent, well, God moves in a mysterious way and it's ultimately for the good. The term freedom fighter and terrorists, they're two sides of the same coin. They certainly were terrorists in that they were going to use terror. They were certainly freedom fighters in that they believed, with some reason, that they were fighting for a freer life for their Catholic confederates. Corpus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi. They concluded their meeting with a private mass, the priest apparently unaware of the plan he was blessing. Animam tuam in vitam eternam. Corpus Domini Nostri Jesu Christi. And so the conspirators sealed their covenant with God and with each other. Amen. And the months of plotting began. The current session of Parliament had only a few weeks to run. It would then be adjourned until February 1605. That gave them a timescale within which to work. But there was much to do. With just seven months to go, they lacked even a base in Westminster. Westminster at this time was basically a rabbit warren inhabited by rabbits wearing silk and ermine. It is a, a boom suburb, it's growing very, very fast. And as the number of court officers expands uh, tremendously under James and his desire to please everybody all the time, so the demand for lodgings increases. It's a, a grubby, messy, untidy, over-moneyed, uh, precious society in which contacts are absolutely everything. Of all the plotters, Percy had the best connections. And milking his link with the powerful Earl of Northumberland, he hit the jackpot. He was appointed a gentleman pensioner, a kind of ceremonial parliamentary guard. Ironic in the circumstances. The appointment gave him an excuse to rent lodgings right in the heart of Westminster, and it was here they installed Guy Fawkes. Now, a reason to choose Guy Fawkes as the man who's going to light the gunpowder is that he wouldn't have been known in London. Now, that may seem very strange to us today when London's a large cosmopolitan city with millions in its population, but in those days, London had a population of thousands, and anybody who was anybody became rapidly well-known. 
Guy Fawkes has liabilities and he has assets, and that's why he's used in London, where uh, the two of them are in best balance. He's a liability because he's a nobody out in the Catholic network of the provinces. On the other hand, he does know about munitions, he's a soldier, he's part of an international network of Catholic conspiracy. And above all, at this time, he's an unknown. He's a man without a name who can move uh, silently across frontiers. And in that great, thriving metropolis, and a, a nameless man with uh, a mission is the best person to have on base. For the London side of the operation, Catesby co-opted two more men in the web of conspiracy. Thomas Bates was Catesby's manservant. Robert Keyes was a recusant gentleman from Lincolnshire, a trusty and honest man, according to the record. These two were to help Fawkes stockpile the gunpowder necessary for the blow, purchased downriver in the docks. Gunpowder is quite widely manufactured in the southeast of England, and obviously during wartime there had been a considerable demand for gunpowder, not least from the ships of the Royal Navy, but also from English merchant shipping because they very often carry cannon to defend themselves. Someone like Fawkes would know where to get gunpowder, having been in those circles um, as a military man. The nearest powder mill to London was in Rotherhithe. It operated under royal license. But with a peace treaty now signed with Spain, there was a glut of powder on the market. The excess was sold off cheap, no questions asked. Fawkes stockpiled 36 barrels, taking his time to avoid suspicion. And he transported them back upriver to Percy's Westminster lodgings, up the Thames, that great artery of early modern London. 36 barrels was 10,000 pounds weight of powder. It would blow with the explosive charge of 250 cannon firing at once. But all that destructive energy was useless unless Fawkes could unleash it in exactly the right spot under the Parliament House. And that was the access they still lacked. The clock was ticking, just two months to go. But then, in December 1604, the state opening was delayed once again, this time to the winter of 1605. One of the dodgiest things about blowing up a parliament is working out when the parliament's going to be there at all. Because parliamentary sessions are delicate things. They impose an incredible strain on the people who are hauled in from the provinces to sit in the commons or the lords. London's notoriously unhealthy, so you can't keep people there for too long. And especially summer months are a dodgy thing because they're the best time for disease. So they put off uh, the meeting until the winter months when, uh, as we now know, the fleas are going to bed. And so plague dies down. For Catesby, the postponement of Parliament changed the scale of the plot. Up till now, he'd planned only the explosion. His grievance focused just on that one act of revenge. Now, with time on his hands, he returned to the Midlands and he began to plan the plot's second stage, a full-blown Catholic uprising. For this, he needed the support of local recusants. So in March, he recruited John Grant of Northbrook House, and Jack Wright's brother, Kit, and Robert Winter, Tom's brother, the wealthy master of Huddington Court. Until now, in a, in a curious way, although it's lunatic, the plot is actually viable. It's, it's the Big Bang theory of destruction, in which you take out your enemy and then work out what happens next. Whereas Catesby now goes on to phase two, and in doing so, he actually makes the plot more likely to fail because more and more people know about it. It's like spinning a spider's web in which you're going to be catching potentially really quite dangerous uh, animals as well as flies. What Catesby envisaged was a cavalry uprising centered on the Midlands. He whispered of the plot to rich noblemen like Ambrose Rookwood and Sir Everard Digby, men famed for their impressive stables. The idea was, in advance of the explosion, a hunting party would be raised. Once the king was dead, this hunting party would show its true colors. It would ride to Coventry and there kidnap James's eldest daughter, the Princess Elizabeth. 
they knew nothing about her. The only advantage was she was living, I think at the time, in, in, in Warwickshire, and they simply thought that Princess Elizabeth, being young and they hoped easily malleable, she would just be a puppet in their hands, and they could say, there we are, James is gone, but now we have James's daughter, she's queen, and they would rule England through her as, as a Catholic country. What Catesby was banking on was chaos. With the Protestant power structure destroyed, his cavalry would press its advantage, stirring the dormant Catholic population, provoking open civil war. It was a wildly ambitious plan. Um, I think that the gunpowder plotters, Catesby in particular, they were very much isolated figures in the Catholic community. I don't think they'd have had anything like the impact within England that they seem to have assumed that they would have done. Most Catholics wanted to keep their heads down. There is about a 1% chance that Protestants would have been so dazed and demoralised that Catesby's lot could actually have seized Princess Elizabeth and made her their stooge. But I wouldn't put that as more than one in a hundred chance. But Catesby was blind to any flaw. He convinced himself God was smiling on his plans. God had provided the gunpowder. God had secured Percy lodgings in Westminster. And if more proof were needed, news now came through from London. The best news of all. At a cost of an extra four pounds paid to his Westminster landlord, Percy had secured a lease on a cellar. It used to be the old palace kitchens. Now it was empty and hired out for storage. And that cellar ran directly underneath the Parliament House. You must think of the Palace of Westminster not as we see it today, because that's a 19th century building very largely, but as a great sprawl of late medieval buildings. Not that difficult, in fact, to get access to, because in Westminster Hall there were the law courts, King's Bench, Common Pleas, and that was an area where ordinary people came and went quite freely. And so, during the summer months of 1605, Guy Fawkes and his confederates smuggled the powder into the cellar, for all the world like servants storing provisions, all quite legal and innocent. Under the very noses of the Protestant state, this powder keg would sit until Parliament reconvened. The gunpowder plot was ready to blow. October 1605, three weeks to go before King James reopened Parliament, and the gunpowder plot was on course. In the palace cellars, the barrels of powder were hidden with firewood for added security. All Fawkes could do now was wait. But Robert Catesby was running out of funds, and so he recruited one more conspirator, the 13th conspirator. Unlucky for some, his name was Francis Tresham. The Treshams were very substantial landholders indeed. Tresham has access to money. He has access to horses. I mean, that may seem to be absurd, but if you have a big house, you have big stables. And horses are, after all, uh, the motor cars, the getaway helicopters of the, of the 17th century. Tresham wielded great influence in Catholic circles. He'd help rally the Midlands. It's clear why Catesby needed him. But Tresham resisted the idea right from the start. Maybe because being wealthy, he had so much more to lose. I implore you, please, not to go through with this. Catesby argued him round, saying a great sickness required so sharp a remedy. But he was taking a gamble. Francis Tresham is the weakest link in the whole chain of conspiracy. He's the one who should never have been taken on board. He's notoriously unreliable, he's notoriously unstable, he's a blabbermouth. It is probably through Tresham the leak actually comes, which uh, scuppers the whole plot. No, we'll not stop now. The trouble was, Tresham was almost too well connected. As Catesby well knew, he had many friends in the House of Lords, Catholic peers who'd die with the rest. They would, of course, go straight to heaven, 
whereas the Protestant ones would go to hell. But it was hardly a prospect that Tresham could envisage with equanimity. The danger was that Tresham might warn his Catholic friends of the existence of a plot. Some say that's exactly what he did. Because on October the 26th, with just 10 days to go before the explosion, Catesby's plot began to unravel. Act one of the drama unfolded in Hoxton, a village a mile north of London. This was the home of William Parker, Lord Monteagle, Tresham's brother-in-law. He was one of those Catholic peers at risk of becoming collateral damage in Catesby's Big Bang. Monteagle is not a nice man. He is uh, from a Catholic family, and the Catholics half-heartedly accept him as one of them. He is officially what we call a church papist, which means that he's looking like a Protestant at the present time. It seems fairly transparent that uh, he is uh, a selfish opportunist who is now playing the Protestant card in public in order to try and make himself a court career. According to the official version of the story, on the evening of October the 26th, Monteagle's servant, Thomas Ward, delivered to his master a letter. Asked whom it was from, Ward described how he'd been accosted outside by a masked stranger. On opening the letter, Monteagle found it contained a warning not to attend the state opening of Parliament, because a sudden and unspecified blow was to be dealt against the enemies of his religion. My lord, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care of your preservation. Therefore, I would advise you as you tender your life to devise some excuse to shift of your attendance at this parliament. For though there be no appearance of any stir, yet I say they shall receive a terrible blow, this parliament. Apparently, Monteagle didn't fully grasp the meaning of this letter. But sensing foul deeds were afoot, he resolved, despite the lateness of the hour, to ride at once to Whitehall, to deliver this warning into the hands of the authorities. Or more specifically, into the hands of James's Secretary of State, the notoriously anti-Catholic Robert Cecil. He's the son of Elizabeth I's greatest minister, William Cecil Lord Burley. So he's a man born to power, born into an immensely wealthy and powerful family. Like Sir Francis Walsingham before him, who was Elizabeth's Secretary of State, one of his major functions was collating intelligence, and he inherited Walsingham's spying. Cecil is seen as the spy master, and that's an anachronistic term. The 16th and 17th century would have called it an intelligencer. It's Cecil's job to get as much intelligence information as he can from Europe and at the same time to keep an eye on potentially difficult groups in England, including, of course, Catholics. It is like running MI5 and MI6 together. Cecil, of course, knew Monteagle. They, they weren't close friends. They weren't much more than ready acquaintances, uh, and there wouldn't be much of a bond between a Catholic peer uh, and the, the leading Protestant in England. Um, but nevertheless, they had a political contact. And Cecil almost certainly would not have trusted Monteagle, but at the same time, he would have recognized that Monteagle, as a Catholic peer, would know a great deal more than Cecil would about what was going on in the Catholic community, particularly at its upper levels. And so Cecil invited in his surprise guest. Monteagle. And Monteagle braced himself to explain this nocturnal intrusion into the inner sanctum of the second most powerful man in the land. Monteagle was taking a risk. The letter linked him with Catholic extremists. But equally, through this act of loyalty, he had much to gain. This letter was delivered to my house this evening. Uh, the contents disturbed me so that I thought to bring it to your attention as soon as possible. And so the letter was handed over. And apparently Cecil too found the letter obscure, just as Monteagle had done. 
and the two men sat into the night discussing the dark and doubtful document, puzzling over its authorship. How came you by this? It was delivered to my house. But meanwhile, events were taking on a momentum of their own. In Hoxton, Monteagle's servant, Thomas Ward, was himself a Catholic on the recusant grapevine. He told the conspirators of the letter. Determined to identify the leak, Catesby and Winter turned at once on the natural suspect, the blabbermouth Francis Tresham. What do you know of this? What? Tell me you're not a man who would betray us. It took some smooth talking and an oath on the Bible to persuade them he was innocent. Tell me about the letter. And it seems they believed him. I know nothing about any letter! It was widely assumed at the time, in the aftermath of the plot, that it was Tresham who was responsible for the letter. The more one looks at it, the more unlikely that seems, because why should Tresham have either written or caused to be written this very obscure letter as a way of warning Monteagle, when all he needed to do was to go to Monteagle, whom he knew perfectly well, and said, by the way, if you're thinking of going to Parliament, it's not a frightfully good idea. Why don't you come hunting or something like that? Historians, dramatists and uh, pulp novelists just love the Monteagle letter because it will forever leave us with a puzzle. We'll never ever be able to say with any certainty who produced it and therefore what the historian's mind naturally does is run wild upon alternative possibilities. One theory is it was written by one of the conspirators wives not to warn Monteagle, rather to spike the plot, this gamble that put recusant estates and dynasties at risk. Or maybe there was no mysterious messenger in Hoxton that night. Maybe Monteagle wrote the letter himself. Maybe he'd heard of the plot on the recusant grapevine and had seen an opportunity to curry favor with the regime. If so, it worked. He ended up fated as the hero of the hour with a pension of 500 pounds a year for life. You've done yourself great service delivering this to us. I am a loyal subject of the king, my lord. But there's another theory casting doubt on the whole official version of that October night. A conspiracy theory which began to circulate within weeks of Fawkes' arrest. It focuses on the shadowy figure of Robert Cecil himself. The reason why conspiracy theories surround this conspiracy is that the government minister who claims to have discovered the plot is himself an arch-conspirator. He is a spy master. He is a manipulator. He's used to orchestrating and rigging assemblies, monarchs and hirelings alike. He comes from a family which itself has a history of rigging plots. Mary Queen of Scots was framed by a combination of politicians, including Cecil's own father. And so with this family background, it is natural for people to suspect that to some extent Cecil rigs the gunpowder conspiracy himself. The supposition is that Cecil knew of the plot long before October. That Cecil's network of spies had fed him information of a stir in Catholic circles. The only question is, how extensive was that information? There's no doubt that Cecil knew fairly early on that something was afoot. Uh, and as the time of the Assembly of Parliament uh, got nearer, uh, Cecil's information became more detailed and more accurate. Some conspiracy theorists go even further, that Cecil was the brains behind the plot, that Catesby, Winter, Fawkes were just pawns in his wicked game. It's far-fetched, but that the spy master knew more than he let on seems incontrovertible. When the formal exposure of the plot comes, which is through the letter delivered to Lord Monteagle, Cecil is, to all intents and purposes, waiting for him. And I'm sure that when uh, Monteagle says to him, my lord, look at this, Cecil looks at it and is not surprised by what he reads. Did Cecil have the letter written? Did Monteagle have the letter written? The, the answer is we don't know. We never shall know. But it's not a boat from the blue either to Monteagle or to Cecil. My apologies again for the lateness of the hour, but I thought it worth bringing to your attention. Cecil had let the plot simmer, 
because he'd seen in it a way of trapping important enemies of the state. Now he would bring the plot to boil, stage managing the denouement. And the letter, whether he wrote it or not, would serve his purpose well. Catesby should have cut his losses when he'd had the chance. He'd chosen to gamble, to underestimate the enemy's hand. It was a bad call. It changes nothing. The letter changes nothing. They know nothing of the powder, they know nothing of our plan. One of the great mysteries of the whole affair is why, having discovered that the plot is disclosed, knowing the government's onto them, Catesby doesn't do the obvious thing and skedaddle. It's, it's fairly blatant now that the conspiracy is going to fail and they're going to pay the maximum penalty. One can only surmise that uh, the mind of a fanatic just doesn't operate in uh, common sense, obvious and rational ways. That having gone this far, Catesby just hopes that human nature will intervene and the normal bungling ways of humanity will enable Guy to get through with a torch at the right moment and the whole lot to go sky high. Nothing is crazy if God wants it and God will organise it for you. It's what happens if you believe in providence. But God, it seems, was with the Protestants. And he had other plans for Robert Catesby. On the 1st of November, 1605, four days before the state opening of Parliament, King James I returned to London from a hunting trip. His chief minister, Robert Cecil, handed him the Monteagle letter the letter revealing the threat to Parliament. Cecil played the innocent. He pretended he was baffled, allowing the king to shine. Where does this come from? We know not, Your Majesty. It was delivered. And of course, James, the wisest fool in Christendom, took the bait. This letter intimates great violence. Always paranoid, obsessed with his own safety, he leapt on the word blow. A blow. He berated a Cecil for failing to grasp the blindingly obvious. A great blow. That suggests to me powder. Powder. In the official version, the king is the first person immediately, brilliantly, spontaneously to perceive the truth of the matter and suggest it might be a good idea if people started searching the cellars beneath the Houses of Parliament and the vicinity of the Palace of Westminster. And uh, in this way, the conspiracy is revealed by the only person equipped by God to do so, which is the brainy monarch himself. Now, this is wildly implausible given quite how sharp Cecil himself is, but in favour of James having some role in it, you have to say that he's a clever man. He is perceptive, quick-witted, and also a very good survivor. Of the six rulers of Scotland before James, only one has not died violently, and he died of nervous exhaustion. James's mother had a head hacked off in an English jail. His father was strangled after an attempt to blow him up. And James himself has survived two attempts upon his life, one allegedly by trapping the assassin's head under his arm and screaming for help for all he was worth. He is used to the idea of attempts on royal lives. He's ready for this one. James charged Cecil with his safety. He called for Westminster to be searched, but still Cecil waited. In his own words, he wanted the plot to ripen to snatch it in full bloom. And so the conspirators made their final preparations, unaware of the net closing in. Catesby's plan was to stay in London until the 4th. He would then ride to the Midlands in advance of the others to join the hunting party raised by Digby as a cover for the kidnap of the young princess. One last time, Tresham urged the others to reconsider. His nerves stretched to the limit. We are prepared to die. But Catesby, Winter and Percy were resolute, ready to abide the utmost trial, to give their lives if necessary. In the cellar, Guy Fawkes prepared a fuse Enough, apparently, to smolder for eight hours before the gunpowder blew. 
His brief was to stay in the Westminster lodgings until after the explosion, to witness the destruction, to confirm the death of the king, and then to ride to join the others with the joyful news. At some point on the 4th, it's known he visited Keyes in Lambeth to collect a timepiece with which to gauge the vital moment. At 11 o'clock on that last morning, Thomas Percy left to pay a visit to his cousin Northumberland at Sion House to see what rumors, if any, were circulating at court. Later that evening, he rendezvoused with Catesby at the Duck and Drake. He told him all was well. There was no talk of the Monteagle letter. Then I go. Catesby left for the Midlands. But Percy was quite wrong. All was not well. Because now, at the 11th hour, Cecil was ready to make his move. His plan was that the king should take all the credit. His denouement would be orchestrated to that effect. The official version has the Lord Suffolk and Monteagle searching Parliament in the early evening and spotting a bearded man, most likely a servant. But they also notice a pile of firewood, a pile too large for the lodgings the cellar served. On further investigation, they discover the cellar's lease to a Catholic, Thomas Percy. They go to the king, they tell him what they've discovered, still apparently unable to put two and two together. And the king, in his wisdom, urges that a second search be made, or he would plainly go next day to Parliament and leave the outcome of the day to fortune. And so Cecil's drama was resolved. Just after midnight, the second search party entered the Westminster cellar. And there they arrested the mysterious stranger, booted and spurred as if for flight. What's your name? John Johnson. He gave a false name. He said he was a servant. My lord! But under the firewood, the barrels revealed the terrible truth. Find him! And Guido Fawkes' place in the history books was secure. The beauty of the official version is that it conjures up such a wonderfully theatrical image. I mean, no wonder we still have it rivet in our minds. Guy with his beard, his hat, his cloak, his dark lantern. It's just so beautifully vivid. It's how, of course, he was actually caught, but uh, the, the, the belief we have to go through in order to reach the point at which we imagine that none of this was stage managed at all requires an act of faith considerably greater than that believing in the Holy Apostolic Church or any other. As soon as Fawkes was taken, a warrant was issued for Percy's arrest. Kit Wright was the first to hear the news. He rushed the Duck and Drake to warn the others. What do we do? The conspirators in London, uh, of whom the leaders are Winter and Percy, uh, have a quick conflab at this stage and work out what to do. We leave. And really they do the only thing sensible left to them. They bolt for the provinces. The conspirators spent the 5th riding through a brutal November landscape. They'd posted horses along the route. It said their cloaks were found later cast by the wayside. Catesby was ahead of them, still ignorant of the news. But somewhere in Bedfordshire, he was overtaken by Ambrose Rookwood. Rookwood had ridden like the wind. It was his thankless task to break the news of Guido's arrest to the man who'd planned the plot. We'll never know how Catesby reacted. The only wise course now, surely, was to keep riding west, ahead of the inevitable chase, to sweep up his friends in the Midlands en route, to escape maybe to Catholic Ireland. But Catesby was never one to play it safe. He rode to Ashby St. Ledges in Northamptonshire, where his mother lived. Too embarrassed to face her, he arranged to meet John Grant and Robert Winter at the edge of the town. There he told them that though Guido was taken, they'd push on regardless. 
They'd join the hunting party. They'd spread the rumor the king was dead. They'd stir the dormant Catholic community into open rebellion. But Catesby was blind to one crucial fact, his own isolation on the margins of mainstream Catholic opinion. As soon as the news arrives of a Catholic plot, it's quite clear that support for Catesby simply fades away and no one comes to join the plotters. There is no mass rising of Catholics at all. Catesby had at his disposal a ragtag cavalry of no more than 40, maybe less, a rump of recusants. They rode from estate to estate, preaching rebellion. But the Catholic majority treated them like lepers. They closed their doors. When Catesby arrives and tells them that the king is dead, I feel sure their, their immediate reaction must have been one of horror, because they were loyal subjects. You don't want the king to be dead even if he's a king of a different religion. He was their king. Secondly, if the king is dead, what sort of horrors does that open up? Who's going to take over? Uh, they've suffered so far, but my God, the suffering that's to follow under Robert Cecil or committed Protestants or whoever would be a great deal worse. They saw at once that this could only make their circumstances more difficult, not better, but considerably more difficult. And they must have feared absolutely the worst, draconian recusancy laws, mass imprisonments, executions, whatever. So I think there would have been virtually no support whatever for this hot-headed, relatively unknown, fanatical, mid-30-year-old saying, this is it, boys, the time has come. Uh, rise up, now or never. And they think, well, in that case, never. Let's get home and uh, lay quietly and see what happens. And so, on the evening of the 7th of November, the remaining plotters reached their last safe house. Hull Beach, on the Shropshire border. Tired, demoralized, hunted, the gunpowder plotters prepared for their final stand. November the 5th, 1605, London. And throughout the day, news of Fawkes' arrest had spread through Westminster. That evening, the first bonfires were lit in the streets to celebrate the deliverance of King James and his son, Prince Henry. There seems to have been a tremendous outpouring of relief, which is understandable not only in terms of the fact that the plot had failed, but also the fact that James had been only two years on the throne of England, and that his death and the death of Henry would have precipitated a major succession crisis. There are nationwide celebrations of bells ringing in churches and bonfires lit. Bonfires are lit as fires of joy. Bonfires are lit to celebrate good news. Bonfires are part of the public outdoor vocabulary of celebration. Remember we're dealing with autumn. The, 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 the actual point in the year when this happens is of interest. It's the 5th of November. It's a dark time of the year in early modern England. No street lighting. So the sudden explosion of light, parish by parish, across London, across the suburbs, out in the country, must have been quite stunning, quite remarkable. Uh, a kind of wake-up call for the senses. So far in the Tower of London, Guy Fawkes had held his tongue, sticking to his alias of John Johnson, refusing to name his accomplices. But on the evening of the 6th of November, the King, always keen to strut his forensic skill, demanded to see Fawkes in person. And so the assassin and his target came face to face. Your name is John Johnson. And you would have killed me, and my lords, and my parliament. 
Well, the fact that there was a meeting at all is remarkable because it was virtually unheard of for a monarch to interview anyone suspected of treason. The first thing monarchs did was distance themselves completely. But no, here's James, and he is wanting to interview Guy Fawkes himself. And you have no regrets. Only that I did not succeed. This is totally in character for James. Whenever a really hot political prisoner comes up, James likes satisfying his own intellectual curiosity and also upping the drama of the moment by interrogating in person. Uh, it shows him to be at the cutting edge of government activity. And what of the royal children? Merely innocents. The king showed off his debating skills, but Fawkes showed him nothing but contempt. I thought to blow you all back to Scotland. That's what I thought. How could you conspire so hideous a treason? Asked his motives, he echoed Catesby's words to Tresham. A dangerous disease requires a desperate remedy. It's not known how his composure affected the king. But what is recorded is what James did next. To modern eyes and ears, the most sinister aspect of James's personal interview with Guy Fawkes is at the end he tosses Guy Fawkes over to acute physical suffering. Now, English law here is actually more humane than most European law because officially you cannot be tortured in order to produce a confession. Under strict English law, somebody can only be tortured in political cases where the person's guilt is already established. In other words, once you've been tried and found guilty. In the case of Guy, his guilt is so absolutely self-evident, he's made no attempt to deny it. He's now prime game for torture. The gentler tortures meant that the manacles would be used, and that meant that the prisoner would be suspended by manacles through the arms on a wall. Now, this could be excruciatingly painful, and, and, and there are instances of prisoners whose hands were permanently maimed as a result. Now, that's the gentler tortures. People didn't always crumble immediately under these. But when it came to the rack, which was the more forceful torture, there were few prisoners who had the courage to even go on the rack. The, the mere sight of it was enough to make them confess or make something up, which some of them certainly did. The rack itself dislocated limbs and caused permanent disability. There are only one or two instances of people who actually held out against being racked, and Guy Fawkes was not one of them. He, he talked, he crumbled. Two examples of Guy Fawkes' signature exist. One from before, one after torture. The second scrawl, Guido, merely hints at the suffering to which he was subjected. All eyes now were on the Midlands. Fawkes' confession had filled in whatever gaps had existed in Cecil's knowledge. It incriminated the rights, it incriminated the winters, and so the end game began. By the time that the conspirators uh, reach what's going to be the last stand, which is Holbeach House, Staffordshire, everything's gone wrong. They're abandoned by their co-religionists. Even the weather's rotten. They've been soaked through on their ride. They're on the verge of despair. They're on the verge of catching colds. Uh, about the only thing remaining for them now is to make an epic last stand and find martyrdom. And after all, if you are a religious fanatic, then to be a religious martyr is a form of victory, and Holbeach is going to be on the surface the rather unlikely setting for one of the great acts of Catholic martyrdom in British history. Holbeach was the property of Stephen Littleton, one of the few recusants in the hunting party who'd not deserted them. They had with them a cache of powder meant for the cavalry uprising. All they'd need now was a small amount for their muskets to defend Holbeach from attack. But when they checked the powder, they found it was damp from the downpour. Maybe it's just proof of how weary they were, how muddled, how desperate, and how amateurish in Fawkes' absence. 
But what happened next was foolish to the point of farce. They tried to dry out the gunpowder in front of an open fire. As part of the tragicomic aspect of the gunpowder conspiracy, nobody actually dies. One poor guy, John Grant, is actually blinded by it because it goes straight into his eyes. And the rest are charred and they're sickly, but nobody's actually killed. The fact that a conspiracy which sets out to blow up the political nation uh, almost ends up by blowing itself up indicates quite this mixture of sheer madness and bungling with genuine heroism in the makeup of the gunpowder conspirators. With the 17th century mentality being so extremely providentialist, they saw this as a clear divine message that God had not been on their side in the powder plot, that indeed God now through powder was rebuking them. So all sense of that spiritual elation must have gone at that point. What do we do? And it was that evening that Tom Winter said to Catesby, what do we do next? And Catesby made the famous remark, we mean here, here, to, here die. to die. Catesby clearly, having come to the end of the road and seeing the plot had failed completely. And maybe realizing that all along it had been an appalling mistake. By the following morning, November the 8th, the Sheriff of Worcester had the house surrounded with a posse of 200 men. Um, I'm always impressed by the, the, the speed, the rapidity with which the news gets to Warwickshire. The Sheriff has his men in arms um, almost before the, the, the conspirators arrive. The speed of the authorities' reaction could imply that they are ready. The final shootout is as epic as any Western. It, it is young guns all over again. It is Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. As the posse, literally, aim their guns from the courtyard, Winter gets a broken arm from a musket ball and reels back inside. The Wright brothers are shot down mortally wounded. Catesby and Percy um, set up a sort of joint defence. There's only a handful of plotters in the house, and they've got the sheriff and his many men outside hammering on the doors. And the men, of course, uh, are armed with muskets, whereas the gunpowder plotters have, on the whole, just swords. And it's just a question of time before they're, they're overwhelmed. Catesby realises this is it, and he turns round, writing his own epic, to Percy and says, right, that's it, lad, let's go out together. And out they came. And in an uncommonly good piece of shooting for the time, muskets being so accurate, this was clearly an accident, the same musket ball actually takes them both out. Percy's killed, I think, instantaneously. Catesby, not quite instantaneously, has time to crawl away uh, into a sort of chapel where there's um, a picture of the Virgin, which he clutches to himself, and so dies clutching the picture of the Virgin, which is very appropriate for a man who, whatever else you may think of him, died for his faith. Not for him, the humiliation, the degrading public ceremony of execution. Never to the last, abandoned by his sense of theater, Catesby has enough brains to know how to die, making the finest possible end scene. The ultimate Catholic icon of a dying martyr. From Hull Beach, John Grant and Tom Winter were taken to the tower. Tom, despairing at having outlived his hero Catesby, was placed in the next door cell to Fawkes, and Cecil had a jailer eavesdrop on their conversations. Within a week, the others were rounded up. Robert Winter, Keyes, Bates, Rookwood, Digby. Francis Tresham didn't last long. 
he developed an inflammation of the urinary tract. He sickened and died in his cell. Meanwhile, news of the plot had spread to every parish in England. Prayers of thanksgiving, hastily printed, were read from every pulpit, and a mood of Protestant triumphalism swept the nation. If the plotters had hoped to relieve the conditions of Catholics in England, it's entirely counterproductive. One of the consequences of the plot is to produce widespread a suspicion of Catholics. All Catholics are tarred with the brush of terrorism. Catholics are regarded as being agents of Antichrist, agents of the devil. All sorts of uh, demonical language is used to describe them. And poor English Catholics who are tr simply trying to maintain their faith in private, uh, bring up their children in, in what they regard as the true religion, find themselves penalized uh, restricted, uh, harassed in all sorts of ways, and demonized by their neighbors. For the government, the immediate need was to round up the dark forces behind the plot. And for Cecil, that meant the Jesuits. Catesby's confessor, Henry Garnet, hid in a priest hole for eight days before they found him. He'd opposed the plot, but they took him to the tower to join the others. The conspirators spent the winter of 1605 here, awaiting trial. Their confessions were extracted, edited, published. Sensational stories to feed a hungry public. And so the official version of the story was born. Uh, the spin is put on it very quickly. I think what we're looking at is a remarkable exercise in government control of message. The government got on message very, very quickly. The message is that God smiles on Protestant Stuart England. It's not simply that they foiled a plot. It's not simply that they have prevented an explosion. What they've discovered, so they say, is evidence of God's active involvement in English Protestant history. It's part of a sequence of deliverances, first of all from Bloody Mary. Queen Mary, who had lit human bonfires and had martyred English Protestants. The deliverance from that was the accession of Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth faces the next great threat from the Catholics, the Spanish Armada. And again, God intervenes. God blew, the Protestant wind, the Armada was scattered. Another miracle, another deliverance. And the deliverance from the gunpowder plot is, is seen, is interpreted, is explained entirely in terms of this continuing sequence of divine intervention. At last, in January 1606, the conspirators were brought to trial, here in Westminster Hall. Treason trials at this period, they weren't so much trials as drama. The only object of the prosecutor was to show up the, the heinous wickedness of trying to uh, destroy God's anointed. So in other words, the, the, the very horror of what they'd done was used by the, um, by the prosecutors, by the state, as a way of reinforcing this sense of English identity uh, and of the sacredness of the king's person. It was reported later that on the day of the trial, James made a secret appearance in an upper room. For him, the plot came at the perfect time. His early popularity was being undermined by his profligacy, his penchant for favorites. The plot blessed him with a divine seal of approval on which he'd draw for the rest of his reign. Remember, remember, the 5th of November. But first, to dispose of the conspirators, a traditional traitor's death. It meant being tied to a hurdle and drawn by horses through the streets of London to the place of execution. And the reason you were meant to be horizontal to the ground was that you weren't supposed to pollute the air that normal people were breathing. You were supposed to be kept at a low level. The punishment would then involve being hanged by the neck until you were not quite dead and then being cut down 
and then you could be either castrated or you could be disemboweled or your heart torn out. And all these things symbolised that you would not live to procreate heirs who were going to be traitors. And then the head was cut off and the body was divided into quarters and the quarters and the head would be displayed on spikes over gates on London Bridge as an edifying example to those who might also think of committing treason. The place of execution was Old Palace Yard, Westminster, within sight of the building they tried to destroy. Cecil, who watched the executions, was struck by their bravery. He remarked how they died as they'd lived, as Catholics, a prayer on their lips. Fawkes was the last to mount the scaffold. Weak with sickness and torture, the hangman had to help him up the ladder. And so died this great devil of the official version, a stick with which to beat English Catholics for generations to come.